Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us here on our YouTube channel again. Well, hey, you know, in the midst of this COVID virus, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, it's such a reminder that we always need to be on the lookout for future and new opportunities that will help us to sustain our agricultural and our farming lifestyle. So in today's episode, I'm going to profile a brand new company that is just coming online called Genera Incorporated. Now they're based down in Tennessee with big plans to move throughout the rest of the United States and they are offering farmers opportunities to grow additional crops with five-year contracts and give them a way to hedge their bets against input and commodity prices and those fluctuations. Really interesting stuff. We're going to get this interview done with Mr. Brad Valentine, their feedstock manager, starting right now. Brad, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me today, Matt. Hey, you bet. I, I really appreciate you folks reaching out to me. I always do appreciate the help with with finding guests to come on and to talk about new opportunities for farmers and ways that people can be successful in, in, in sustaining this agricultural lifestyle. So I am excited to learn more about your company, Genera, and, and everything you do today. Sure. No, I think it'll be a good conversation. All right. Well, let's start off with you. So tell us about you. Where do you come from and, and what's your history? So I am the I'm the current feedstock manager for Genera. So in that role, I offer technical and agronomic assistance to our growers and producers uh, that are that are looking to uh, you know grow these crops for us. Uh, I started out in my career. I was working for a large seed company for Pioneer Seed Company. Uh, I did an internship with them directly out of college. Uh huh. And that sort of led into a full-time position. So I spent about eight years with them in the uh, Mid-South area of the Mm -hmm. country, uh, working on soybean breeding and and product development there. Very cool. I host a podcast for Pioneer called Corn Revolution. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, very cool. So I've learned quite a bit about what it is that you were doing. So you did that, you you did that, started as an internship in college and then went right into that for Pioneer after, after the internship? Yeah, I had a short stint with another with another company there where uh, I dealt with corn, wheat, and soybeans. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were a consulting company, and they did their own research in the background. So I worked with them for about seven or eight months there after the internship, and then a uh, position came open with Pioneer, and I really enjoyed the time there. So I decided to go back and and work for them. Okay. Now, did you grow up farming? Uh, I actually did not. So I spent, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time helping friends and family on on their farm and their operations. Uh, You know, I grew up in Middle Tennessee, so it's a large cattle, Mm -hmm. uh, predominantly cattle area and hay. And, you know, spent a lot of time around that, you know, was involved in FFA and, uh, you know, took a lot of those agriculture classes and and it just kind of went from there. Okay. Yeah, the FFA is great. I, I interview a lot of FFA students, and it's amazing the careers that that organization can launch. Oh, for sure. Okay, very cool. So you grew up around it, uh, got involved in the FFA, and that, that spurred the interest that took you into college. And then did you major in agronomy or something like that in college? So I actually had I actually went to school at uh, Tennessee Tech in Cookville, Tennessee, and have a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. Okay. And uh, my focus was actually in agriculture business or agriculture economics. And, you know, after the internship that I did there, I got, you know, really involved in the agronomics and, and that sort of side of things. So it just kind of has pushed my career in that direction. Okay. And so that took you to, to Pioneer with a brief stint with another company. And then was it from Pioneer to Genera? Correct. So I joined Genera in July of last year. Okay. Uh, you know, being from being from the Middle Tennessee area, I have family scattered all around East Tennessee as well, and I had been looking for an opportunity to get back this way, but still be involved in agriculture and in, in, you know, to an extent, and uh, found this opportunity with Genera, and and I really think what they what we've got going on here is a great product and a great program, and uh, you know, it's it kind of went from there. All right. Well, let's not uh, let's not waste another moment. Tell me about tell everybody about Genera and and what it is they do and how this can how this can apply to to farmers. Sure. So at Genera, we've 
we've sort of developed a working with some other uh, industry partners, developed a process to take agriculture fiber. Um, so our main our main crops of interest are switchgrass, biomass sorghum. Uh, we do work with some uh, wheat straw as well. So we actually take that and produce a slurry, or most people would probably know it as pulp, okay. um, similar to a uh, similar to a uh, you know a hardwood tree or, or a tree paper mill. Uh, one of the biggest differences with with our product and our process is it's more of a, a term we like to refer to it as brute force and ignorance. So it's more <laughs> mechanical and less chemical involved okay. in the process of extracting those fibers. Uh, so we'll take those fibers and process them. We actually have uh, thermoforming capacity on site. You know, the bulk of our products that we make in the beginning will be plates, bowls, and to-go containers uh, that will go into the market as fully compostable and biodegradable products. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but the other the other percentage of, of product that we will make will be what we call a wet lap board. And basically, that's just a pulp or a fiber board, and that will be sold to uh, towel and tissue manufacturers, and they will take that and actually make uh, paper towels, paper tissues, and those sort of things. It's a it's a different process to make the the toweling and the tissue. Uh, so you know, we we are not set up initially here to produce those types of products. Okay. Now, is Genera is Genera based there, right there in Tennessee? Yeah, so Genera is based in Vaughn, or we actually have been around uh, since I want to say around 2008, 2007 time frame. So spun out of a research initiative with the University of Tennessee during the biofuel initiative days. Mm -hmm. So Genera was tasked with uh, supplying the uh, there was a research scale facility. Uh, ethanol, cellulosic ethanol facility here in Von Or, and Genera was actually tasked with supplying the feedstock for for that, um, mm -hmm. for that uh, facility there. And you know when uh, when the biofuels initiative, uh, a lot of the money and, and the government incentives for that sort of gone went away, um, and Dow and Dupont merged in 2015, I believe. Uh, they sort of closed up shop here and moved on. And my, um, you know, the, uh, the leadership at Genera now, you know, saw that, you know, we could, we could certainly gather up and round up the troops to produce the, the raw materials and, you know, decided to come up with a way to make a product with those uh, raw materials that we were still producing in okay. our area. Interesting. And then, of course, with, you know, I'm assuming that with the, the bowls and the plates and the things that you're making, uh, in the marketplace, you're competing with styrofoam and plastic, except you're compostable, and that's probably where your edge is. Yeah, so that's the that's that's the big ticket winner. There is, you know, we're 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 the market is targeting the 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 styrofoam and the single use plastics, as you say, and and definitely the the whole sustainability aspect of that is what draws consumers to our products. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when when was that transition done? Like how how long has Genera been producing? Uh, these products so we are actually uh building out our facility still and sh will be online in october of this year okay so we're in the ramp up stage still correct okay very cool and so with what's going on uh if i'm understanding the timeline correctly you already had a network of farmers that were growing biomass for you for the biofuels and over the last several years you've been transitioning uh, to taking what they can grow for you to be producing these products. Yes, yeah, so there was there were several several growers in the region that that participated in that in that biofuels program, and uh, you know given the fact that there has not necessarily been a market for the the switchgrass uh, from the end of that program to kind of where we are now, mm -hmm. you know a lot of these growers have found other markets, you know, even a lot of them, we help them find other markets at the end of that, that, that other project. Um, so there are a few, a few growers that were involved with us in the beginning that are, that are still on board and, and will be producing for us now. And, you know, certainly some more out there, a lot of acres are, have been trans retransitioned back over into crop ground or pasture ground, mm -hmm. uh, after the after the end of that program and, and some guys that still had it in, like I said, had found other markets or were using it for, you know, a hay or a forage product for their livestock. Okay. 
and you right now you've assessed the uh, I guess the acres you're going to need under cultivation for your products to be able to to get you started. Is that correct? Correct, correct. So at full at full capacity, our plant will will require fifty six thousand bone dry tons of material a year. So depending on the mix of feedstocks there, you know that's roughly anywhere from six to nine thousand acres. Okay, six to nine thousand acres. And are you trying to source all of that right there in Tennessee? So that is the plan. the the, the goal of the the goal of the uh, the plant here is to have most of the acres within. Uh, a 60 mile radius and and potentially up to a hundred mile radius of the plant. Okay. Uh, you know, in the early stages, while we while we ramp up, we will be sourcing uh, supplies from other areas. And you know, another issue there too is being that switchgrass is one of our main feedstocks. You know, it's a native warm season grass that'll take two to three years to really reach full maturity and produce uh, the, the tonnages that it can. Mm -hmm. So there, there is, you know, like we've noted here several times, sort of a ramp up period to that as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm assuming that you, you, do you have some commitments already for these end products? We do. So a lot of our products are pre-sold for the majority of our products that we'll be manufacturing uh, are pre-sold for almost five years in advance. Oh, wow. Okay. So you've got a pretty, I mean, you're able to project out five years pretty well then if you've, if you've got that done. Yeah. Yeah. There is a, there is a high demand for these products. Okay. And so what's your competition in the marketplace? Are there other companies that are doing this? So uh, currently there may be one other, uh, company here in the States that's doing this to my knowledge. Um, when, when we come online and get this going, we will certainly be the largest. Uh, the biggest competition here would be a lot of these products now come from Asian markets. So it's, it's using uh, sugar cane bagasse, mm -hmm. uh, from Asian markets and, and the, the material and fiber is, is processed and, and shipped from other countries to China. And then these products are molded in China and then shipped, put on a boat and shipped over here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're, this will be the first domestically sourced or the, the largest mm -hmm. domestically sourced and domestically produced product in that marketplace. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, there's all this talk right now, of course, before coronavirus, there was, there was the tariffs and, and the unfair competition and the intellectual property theft and all of this coming out of China and out of Asia. How do you guys, when you look at this and you're looking at competing with that, how do, what's your edge in being able to source this in the United States? Well, I, I think the whole sustainability story and, and having that product being uh, fully domestically sourced and produced in the United States. So when we get a lot of say, say we have a box or a lot of plates, you know, we'll be able to take that lot number and trace that all the way back to the specific farm that it came off of. Mm -hmm. OK. And, and so when it comes to I mean, so your customers are going to be are they going to be uh, like restaurants and chains and things like that that are doing takeout or or uh, boxing stuff up when people don't finish enough in the in the dining room? Yeah. So, you know, right now our customers are large uh, distributors. So we, we okay. sell to wholesale distributors there. And then, yeah, they they would they would then sell it to those type of customers that you're talking about. Okay. And the reason I'm asking is I'm just trying to get a feel for it because I like the message and I like, I like what's behind it. And I certainly like it being uh, produced from, from tonnage grown on American soil. I like all of that. But I, as I picture kind of moving down the supply chain to the wholesalers, do they care about that or do they just want to, are they just focused on the bottom line, which is the price? Well, you know, the price is always going to be uh, an, uh, a, uh, a an issue there, um, but you know what you what you start to see is, is people are really focusing on sustainability in all aspects of their life, and and this is just another another piece of that puzzle there. Uh, you know if you if you realize that this is grown on on American soil and produced by American workers and, and you know creating American jobs, then you know you a lot of people have a tendency to pay a little, maybe pay a little more, a little extra to, to know that, uh, to know the source of their, of their mm -hmm. product. Yeah. Okay. Well, all very interesting. And I'm kind of going down that rabbit hole with you, but what I want to, I kind of want to bring the focus back. 
which is to helping farmers and uh, and I know we're starting off right there in your in that radius you described uh, there in Tennessee but tell me how this is going to create additional opportunities for farmers yeah so you know currently in our area there are a lot of underused uh, acres or, or marginal acres that maybe aren't producing revenue uh, or large landowners absentee landowners uh, that that could be interested in you know putting their acres in a in a program with us to where they could you know generate some revenue to at least cover any uh, underlying expenses and and also you know for the farmer and producer there you know provides another stream of revenue for his operation. Mm -hmm. And you're talking marginal areas, so uh, you know I, obviously the farmers they're going to be making an economic decision when they decide to go with you or not. So if they're if they're looking at acreage that they're they're going to have to choose say between soybeans or you know switchgrass or something like that, do can they make that decision or is it always going to default to a commodity like soybeans or corn or something like that? So typically you know in our area you you see you know it's sort of split up. You've got your crop growers and then you've got your your hay and your cattle guys. Mm -hmm. when, when I said marginal ground, you know those are just the acres that we that we typically would. Uh, that most people would, would put into this program just because their other acres are more productive and they can certainly make make more money, produce more revenue on their on their greater ground mm -hmm. there. Um, you know, and, and we don't want to be um, disruptive to any to any operations that are going on on a farm right now. You know, one of our one of our terms or our lingo is we like to be an additive to what a mm -hmm. grower currently has going on. Gotcha. OK. So that's great. So they've got a piece of ground that maybe is not good enough ground to grow their normal rotation on. They can do something for you there. And if the if the bottom of the market falls out on soybeans or corn or whatever they've got in their rotation that year, they've got you guys over here as a hedge to that. Correct. Yep. No that that would be a, that would be a good uh, that would be a a good explanation there. Okay. Good. That's excellent. So. Uh, you know, this is exciting, and my show is actually broadcast all over the United States, Canada, Australia, England, um, but mostly about 90% of my listeners are here in the U.S. and in the lower 48. So what are the possibilities for these type of opportunities expanding out to farmers beyond the geographical area we're talking about right now? So I'm glad you asked that, Matt. So, you know, right now we're starting here in Tennessee. Uh, that's where the, the, the founders and the leadership is all based. Uh, but, you know, very soon after we have plant one up and running, we will be looking to expand into other other plants throughout the uh, throughout the country here. So there's mm -hmm. certainly going to be opportunities down the pike to come. And does it do you have to be, you know, in that zone so you can grow the types of, of fiber or the types of uh, biomass that you need? Or say if you get up into a, a northern zone, you get up into the upper Midwest or something like that. Uh, can there be some sort of a biomass grown there that you could use? Sure, there there are there are certain you know certain biotypes or biomass crops that fit in different geographies of the country here. Uh, you know, switchgrass can be grown pretty much all throughout the country. There's two types of switchgrass. You have your upland type and your lowland type. So you know, down here in the south, we focus on lowland. It's been proven to produce higher yields and be a more productive variety for. Uh, for the for the growers and then you know the further north you go you get into that upland variety it tends to be a lot better it, it has a it has a better hardiness to to get through the winter mm -hmm. uh, or the harsher winters that you guys have up there mm -hmm. and then oh you know that is the perennial crop and there's also annual crops that that we throw in there the the biomass sorghum could certainly be grown or grown in different areas of the country and you know, I also mentioned wheat straw at the beginning so that's another that's another option out there and there's certainly a lot of that grown in the in the Midwest and the, and the northern geographies of the country there. Yeah, that's excellent. Now, is there, you know, there's a lot of cover cropping going on these days. Is, is there any chance that uh, some of the things that you need could, could eventually be grown as a cover crop and then be pulled off the revenue generated there, then they could follow it with their commodity crop? Certainly. I mean, so that's that's where a lot of guys are going with their with their wheat and their biomass sorghum down here. So you could grow your biomass sorghum in the summer and then come behind with your winter wheat. So winter wheat is, is the big, you know, the big ticket down here. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're kind of double cropping that and you can sell both crops to Genera that way. Oh, really? Oh, that's excellent. And then and what about once uh, once they've taken off uh, the crop for Genera? 
can they follow that with livestock? Can they graze that? Or does that contaminate the uh, the biomass that you're going to be using later? Sure, no. And, and one of the things that, that we often push is using animal litter or animal, animal manure for fertilization. You know, if it's available, that's a great tool to use. So there's certainly no... Um, no obstacles there to to grazing uh, behind uh, harvesting these crops. Oh, man. Well, I mean, this all sounds great to me. Why is this just happening now? It seems like this would have happened, you know, two decades ago. <laughs> you know, Matt, that's a question that I don't know that I could answer <laughs> for you, buddy. Well, it sounds good, but I think the uh, the demand for these sustainably produced products uh, are probably quite a bit higher. They're probably justifying this more these days. Well, and, and that's it. You know, there, there, is a, there is a cost difference associated with these products versus styrofoam or plastics. But the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the whole story and the sustainability aspect is, is really what captures the consumer's eye and, and tends to be doing so in, in a more uh, in an ever increasing rate there. So uh, I think that's sort of why the push to that has, has, been, has been as strong as it has here recently with us. Yeah, that's exciting. So is is you've obviously got your your five year projections, at least your baseline, because you've got commitments out for five years. I'm assuming you've or Genera has left itself room to grow as demand increases over that half a decade. No, there, there's certainly room to grow, and that ties back into what I mentioned earlier about you know very soon we'll be looking to you know expand our our processes or or even you know. Um, build new facilities in different areas to to meet those growing demands that is interesting and is there so are you always going to be building new facilities or is there any chance of retrofitting say an old facility where it has been shut down for some reason and jobs have been lost so it's interesting that you asked that because the current facility that we are entering here in tennessee actually was the old uh cellulosic ethanol plant so mm -hmm. we we were able to make use of that facility and uh, go in and retrofit it. And, you know, our our right now, our plan is is to have or provide over, you know, 80 to 100 jobs in an area there that 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 doesn't have a whole lot of jobs uh, to begin with. Yeah, oh, that's excellent. Excellent that that can happen. So that's exciting. If this if this jumps off, I mean, any any new or additional opportunities for farmer that's, farmers that's going to give them an edge and keep them going uh, in unstable or uncertain times, that's a big deal. For sure. Now, uh, we can't ignore the reality of what's going on right now. I mean, so many of your products uh, are going to be used in the food service industry, but the food service industry is just getting decimated right now uh, because of COVID-19. Is that impacting any of your, your future prospects or those long-term contracts? Uh, you know, as, as far as that goes, I don't know that I could speak to that, Matt. Uh, that's sort of a different branch of, of, uh, of our, of our business or operation here. And I, and I don't have a whole lot of contact with that. My, my contact is mainly surrounded, uh, with the producers and the farmers in our areas and helping them with, you know, the technical and agronomic aspects of, of what's going on there. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about Genera's, uh, ownership, uh, really quick. Are, is it a, is it a, is it a self-encompassed company? Is it a subsidiary? Is it going to be publicly traded? What are what are we looking at as terms of the business structure here? Genera is a is a privately owned company, and, and I don't believe there are any plans in the future to become a publicly traded company. Okay, uh, that's you know all things can change, but as of right now, I believe that's the direction of management. Okay, and that's all I'm asking. I you know I just wanted to know if it was if it was a subsidiary of a larger company or if they if they're small enough and agile enough to to make maneuvers and pivots in the marketplace as things grow and demand changes. And it sounds like that's the case. Yeah. So so we are a very small company. You know, right now we are about 20 employees, mm -hmm. um, and 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 looking to you know looking to add on. We'll be adding team members very soon as as the plant comes online there. So. Uh, Certainly small enough to be uh, flexible and, and maneuverable in the marketplace mm -hmm. and, you know, not not as much red tape and, and hoops to jump through uh, when it when it comes time to make decisions that would affect um, the, the end product there. Sure. Now, in your position, are you having direct one on one contact with the farmers who are going to be growing biomass for you? Yeah. So that has been my key sort of my key uh, push here since since I've came on board, you know, is, is recruitment of growers and, and out working with them. Actually this week I've worked with, uh, I've, 
I've been on two farms this week. One I was looking at doing some some test plots with, and another I was helping to calibrate his uh, seed drill, so he'll be ready to go as soon as it dries up. Uh, okay. It's been it's been a uh, extremely wet winter and spring here. I actually checked it this morning, and and right here where the plant is at, we have got uh, right just a little over 33 inches of rain since the first of the year. Oh, boy. Yeah, I live in Idaho where we get 11 inches a year. So that, yeah. that's crazy. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. So when you when you walk onto a farm and, and you're talking with a farmer, I'm sure they've got a ton of questions. Um, and I'm sure they're always asking you, you know, how does it work? How What am I committed to if I sign up with you? Uh, is the price set at the beginning? Uh, you know, how do we set the price on, on what we're getting out of this? How do we deal with the fact that some of these crops have to ramp up over time, so I'm not going to get maximum yields for three or four years or something like that. How do you answer those questions? Certainly. So, you know, to answer the question about price, our production agreements do have a set price, and it clearly states within our agreement that price will not go down over the term of the agreement. Uh, you know, you mentioned about the ramp up period in the perennial crop of switchgrass there. You know, to combat that, we start out of the gate offering an initial five year uh, production agreement. Uh, for that crop. And then we, um, you know, it's set up to where it can be automatically renewed every year after that, uh, unless one party or the other decides, you know, that it's time to to do something different there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our our hope and our plan is is that, you know, we will just renew these contracts as we go. You know, I would love to offer a 10-year contract to somebody. However, that's not realistic. You know, by, by the time that those five years is up, we'll probably need to do a price increase you know, just because inputs seem to go up every day and, and the the end price that the farmer get never seems to go up. But, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're not a part of that problem there. We, we want to be a part of the solution for those guys. And then the, you know, the annual crop, the biomass sorghum or the wheat straw there, you know, we offer one to three year contracts on those. Um, and, you know, those those prices are set as well. So, you know, it, it is it is a flat a flat price across the board. So there, there's no differences between farmer A and farmer B. Mm -hmm. OK, you know, we, we want to treat everybody fairly. You know, that's interesting, too. You, you've you mentioned the the biomass sorghum. So when you say it that way and, and sorghum is not a crop that I have been around, I've always been in the West. Uh, but when you say biomass sorghum, does that mean it's a it's a variety of sorghum where you're not pulling any syrup out or anything like that? Correct. So it's a, and I don't know that I could speak 100% to to this, but I'll, I'll give it a shot here. So that is a that is a purpose uh, purposely bred sorghum variety, and its main main purpose is to get tall and stemmy and have very little leaf and not produce mm -hmm. much seed head. So you know we had a uh, we had a couple plots here two years ago that had had stalk heights of 20 foot within them. Wow. 20 yeah. 20 feet. It, and, and that's within a hundred days. So, so this crop will certainly uh, get up there and get moving pretty quick. You know, we we do recommend uh, to to start harvest on this material uh, once it reaches about fifteen foot, because when you get when you get twenty foot tall, it just almost becomes too much to handle. Now, if we were out in Idaho and we had self propelled windrowers to to uh, harvest this material, well, it probably wouldn't be that that big of an issue. But uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, with the typical hay. Hey, equipment that we have in our area, you know, yeah. that's certainly something we have to look out for. My goodness. I want to grow this 20 foot variety on the perimeter of my farm just to hide me from my neighbors. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keep everybody out. You know, uh, a lot of guys have, have grown it for uh, like a, like a cover in their, in their food plots or, or hunting properties. So folks won't be looking in and that sort of thing. So uh, there's definitely some other uses for it, but it's, it's purposely grown for, for biomass and, and you know it produces a great fiber, and that's and that's what we're looking for. So wow, that's pretty cool. Very cool. I'm I'm getting close to wrapping up, but I want to make sure that I give you the opportunity to get everything in that you want to get in. Is there any any information you definitely want to get out that I haven't asked you about? I would just say that if folks are interested in more information and learning more about what we have going on, to visit us on our website at www.generainc.com. And, you know, if you're more interested in the farming side, uh, you can do generainc.com slash farmers, and that will take you directly to our splash page that, that has information, and there is a form on there you can fill out, and it will send an email directly to me, and, and I could reach out to you and, you know, discuss the opportunities that we have. 
Very cool. And you know, another question I should have asked, and I and I forgot to. Uh, is there a minimum amount of acreage that a farmer needs to have available for you before you'll consider them? So that's one of the that's one of the largest questions that I get on a on a on a daily basis. And you know, currently we do not have a minimum acreage. I I deal with growers that are growing anywhere from ten acres to two hundred acres. Mm-hmm. You know, I would say an average farm size uh, for us would be in that forty to fifty acre mark. Uh, just, you know, land is not as prevalent around here as it would be in other parts of the country. And and a lot of farms are not thousands of acres. Yeah. Okay. So if a farmer in a, outside of the region that, that you're currently getting biomass from, if they're interested in hoping this is coming to them at some point and they'd be interested in doing this, is there a way for them to, I don't know, make contact or maybe be on some sort of a waiting list or a newsletter or something that notifies them if and when this might be moving into an area where they could they could produce for you. You know, you may be creating more work for me there, but that's actually <laughs> not a bad idea. Uh, we we currently do not have something like that as we're we're kind of all in 100% focused on getting this first one up and running and off to the races. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I would say once again to uh, refer back to the website and you know, as we as we move on, I may add a, an application like that on there so so folks could. Uh, you know, go on there and put some information in, and we could send out a newsletter and send out updates and that sort of thing. Okay, very good. Well, this is great. I always like to profile new opportunities for farmers, and I hope this grows and expands so everybody within the sound of our voices can have the opportunity to to kind of hedge their bets by by producing some biomass for you, Brad. No, that would be great. That that would also be my hope as well. So we will. We'll, we will see how this uh, this all turns out, and hope that we all get through the the current pandemic uh, in a, in a in a safe and, and healthy manner there, and be able to uh, get this up and running here this fall. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing this with us today. Yeah, Matt. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the appreciate the time. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody, and thank you to Brad Valentine and Janera Incorporated for offering us that great information today. And as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.